Okay, hello and welcome back, everybody. We're moving on to part two of the book. This is kind of uh, the part of the book that all PDE's courses you take as an undergraduate are going to cover. These are the solution methods that we can actually construct for explicit solutions. They really apply to all versions of first order PDEs and uh, linear constant coefficient second order PDEs. So we get we get fairly restrictive in PDEs on the sorts of uh, PDEs we can actually find solutions for. Not too bad in, in in uh, first order, we definitely handle nonlinear PDEs in first order, but getting into second order and higher order after that, um, you know, even non-constant coefficients are pretty hard to deal with. So this is this is going to be uh, the next two chapters, and we're just going to start with first order PDEs in chapter three. And in fact, there's three sections here. The first order PDEs, for the most part, show up in the third of these three. Okay, we're going to encounter them today, uh, maybe in the next video, actually, but perhaps today. And it's going to be a, a subset of first order PDEs for, for section 3.1. And then in section 3.3, we'll actually cover kind of the general first order PDE that we can solve. So getting into section 3.1, I'm calling it flows and characteristic curves, because to a certain extent, these are the same thing. Um, characteristic curves are kind of a one dimensional flow. And I want to talk about what a flow map is to start. So flows and flow maps, we can think about are the same thing. What these are is functions from, I mean, technically it's any form of a semi-group, but they're really functions from the positive, positive real numbers and, and a vector space. So think RD into the same vector space. And it's very important, this definitely has to be the same vector space. We can't go from one vector space to another. But what we're thinking is, is our function, I, I'm using capital Phi here, it has a time parameter and it has a vector space parameter. That's all we want to think. But this function satisfies a very, very particular property, which is the fact that if we compose the function in space, we can instead add the function in time. And so these are really, really important functions for the main reason that they allow us to translate composition, which is a notoriously poorly behaved operation on functions. Um, you know, I think going all the way back to pre-calculus, students hate function composition for good reason. And going all the way back to elementary school, students love addition. So you can translate composition into addition via flow maps. And this is really the definition I have in the middle. What, what's going on here is this is a composition of phi with itself, but I've only put it inside of the spatial term. And we have two copies of phi on the left. We only have one copy of phi on the right. But what have I done is I've added the temporal terms together. So you're allowed to eliminate composition with itself through the process of adding temporal terms. Now, Something that's really common with this is that we will instead, instead of putting the time parameter inside of phi, you can put it actually as a power on phi because this is really useful. What does this look like? This looks like a product of exponentials. And we can get into some really deep theory if we wanted to about how all flow maps are exponential maps. Um, this kind of is the basis for what's called Lie, Lie algebras and Lie theory, named after Sophus Lie. Um, the fact that all flows and exponentials are kind of the same thing. Uh, but if we use this notation of putting t in the superscript, then we can think about it as, as an exponential. We're doing a product of exponentials where we all know that when we add products or multiply products of exponentials together, we can add uh, what's in the exponent instead. So that's a very useful notational convenience of flow maps. But something I, I think maybe nobody who's watching this has realized yet is where do flow maps come from? You know, I, I'm giving all of this very vague definition of what flow maps are, and in fact, they're not, they're not a vague thing at all. They are the solutions, the solutions to first order initial value problems. So you've, you've been working with flow maps for most of your ODEs course. Uh, anytime you had a first order initial value problem, it needs to be, technically it needs to be autonomous. And if you remember what that means, that means that the right-hand side didn't explicitly depend on time. Um, so I'll write an example of one of these uh, IVPs right over here as an example. 
if I do something like y prime equals f of y and y at time zero equals uh, a value x. Okay, so let's assume that the, the independent variable is t. y prime equals f of y, y at zero equals f, has solution, you know, some y of t. But in fact, the solution depends on the initial value x. And this is how we can define flow maps. This would be the flow of t comma x. So the, the time parameter of a flow map is just the amount of time you've, you've stood in an initial value problem and moved forward. The x in a flow map is just actually your initial value, wherever the, flow, the, the initial value problem started. So this is where flow maps arise from. They really are just solutions to first order initial value problems. And we can really emphasize this idea of first order initial value problems with the following theorems. This is called the infinitesimal generator. Um, and what happens is if you start with a flow map, so let's, let's start with some phi here, and we're gonna compute the limit. And this should look like a derivative. This really is a derivative. We're gonna compute the limit in the temporal variable. We're gonna compute the derivative in the temporal variable. So that's why I'm calling it a partial derivative in time. But I'm using it as a limit quotient. This is just your limit definition of the derivative. in time. So if that exists for all fixed times and places x, you define uh, this big capital F. So I'm, I've given it a capital and a bold face because what do we want to think about F? F is actually, it's a, it's a function. It's a function on the same domain as the flow map itself. But it's actually really, you want to think about this as a, a function on flows, not necessarily functions on the domains. You define it as whatever this partial derivative is acting on the flow and you can find out that that as a function of x actually this doesn't have to be r plus there it's really just as a function of x you can compute it as capital f is a vector valued function of the vector x is computed by uh, the partial derivative in time of the flow phi evaluated at time t equals zero. So it really is, it's a function on flows to themselves. But if we want to think about them just as functions on the vector space, they are actually just the, the derivative of the flow in time evaluated at t equals zero. And this is going to have a very special name. It's got the name infinitesimal generator. Okay, so this function is called the infinitesimal generator of the flow. And in fact, this is where we were going from the beginning. The flow solves this IVP. There's a very specific initial value problem that the flow solves. And the, you can think about it as the flow and the infinitesimal generator are intimately related through the, the initial value problem. So the infinitesimal generator show is, is what produces the initial value problem. And sometimes we want to find this initial value problem. If we already know a flow, you say, hey, what's the uh, initial value problem that the flow solves? Or you can do the reverse and you can say, hey, I've got an initial value problem. I want to solve it. Can I find the flow which solves it? So you can go in both directions uh, with these flows. And now it's pretty easy to go in one direction and say, hey, the flow is going to give me a differential equation because all that required is that I find the partial derivative and I evaluate the partial derivative at zero. So starting with a flow and ending with the differential equation is a fairly easy process. But going in the reverse is not as easy to start with a differential equation and end up with a flow. That's you know, exactly what it means to solve a nonlinear differential equation in lots of situations. So those are not the easiest thing to do. But what we're going to see with what I'm calling them, you know, what a lot of people call the method of characteristics, what we're going to see with these characteristic curves or the method of characteristics is we're going to take the perspective that we're going to start with a hypothetical flow map, something that we don't actually know what the flow map looks like. We're going to say, let's send it into an IVP, whatever this flow map is, we're going to send it into an IVP. Then we're going to, we're going to use, use other knowledge to learn about this. So somehow we're going to learn about the IVP that our hypothetical flow map solves. And once we learn about the IVP, we can solve the IVP and we can end up with a realized flow map, a true flow. And so it's that direction that's going to be really useful. And that's the direction of the characteristic curves. So what we're going to do is start with, this is going to be the first PDE that you all learn how to solve in this, in this, uh, 
course is going to be what's called the flow PDE. And it's called the flow PDE for very natural reasons. Um, we can either talk about it as a flow PDE because we're going to solve it using a flow, a flow map. But why are these called flow maps? This is kind of the more important term is if we look at what's going on here, gamma prime is a vector evolving over time. What is this vector that evolves over time? This describe describing the uh, instantaneous velocity of a quantity. And in this case, the quantity is you know, phi, which is going to be the solution. So if we have knowledge of the instantaneous velocity of something, then we can solve we can solve what it uh, where where it goes over all of time. So basically, you want to think about a rubber duck in a bathtub. Here's my bathtub. Here's a drain, uh, and then we're going to drain some water out of the bathtub. So the water is going to be spiraling down. And suppose you have a little rubber duck in here. Oh, it's pretty hard to see, but you got a little rubber duck in there. You know the rubber duck's instantaneous velocity so long as you've calculated the spiral. You know, over time, where is the rubber duck going to be? You calculate its velocity at that point, and then you just see that the rubber duck kind of traverses its path through through the bathtub and down down to the drain. So that's going to be a flow. It's the rubber duck actually flowing, and you're going to some people will call this an advection PDE, although that's very slightly different. Um, but you can uh, you can solve this PDE uh, using flows. So we're going to do that. We're going to do that. So what is the solution? The solution is not that bad, actually. It's just, hey, if we've established what our instantaneous velocity is and we have an initial condition, then the solution is just the uh, initial condition evaluated at the antiderivative of the instantaneous velocity. So uh, given initial condition f of x, solution is antiderivative of gamma prime, well, that's why I put a prime on it, aka gamma, um, inside of f, the initial condition. And you want to make sure that gamma at time zero actually is this value, right? If we're evaluating zero at um, the initial condition, then you want to make sure that gamma zero is equal to x, but that's always going to be possible because it's an antiderivative, and so up to the choice of constants in your antiderivative, you'll be able to find it and make sure that it, it equals x. So let's actually see this in practice. Um, gamma t is the flow, by the way. Uh, you can think about the flow acting on curves as just shifting the curve itself. Well, let's actually look at an example of this solution to a flow PDE. What's going on here is I've got, this maybe doesn't look like the PDE that I've written above. So let's actually translate maybe what would this look like if I actually perform the dot product and the gradient, recall the gradient is spatial derivatives, and then I have a partial derivative in time on the left there. So if I compute the dot product, it's partial derivative in time of phi is going to be partial derivative in x of phi times gamma x prime plus partial derivative in y of phi times gamma y prime plus partial derivative in z of phi times gamma z prime. And that could keep going to the number of spatial derivatives I have. So what we always want to think about with flow PDEs is there's a partial derivative in x times some function of time, a partial derivative in y times a function of time, a partial derivative in z times a function of time, and so on. And then when we look here, that's exactly what we see. So what's going on? We've got a partial derivative in x times a function of time, partial derivative in y times a function of time. And then we've got to be a little careful because there's actually a partial derivative of t times a function of time. So we have to be very slightly careful and say, wait a minute, the theorem didn't have this here, so we should get rid of this. How do we get rid of root t on partial t? Just divide by it. Divide everything by it. So we're going to divide everything by root t, and we end up with t to the 3 halves here. We end up with t to the 1 half plus t to the minus 1 half there. And then moreover, the theorem we had did not have the equal sign equal 0. It had an equal sign right about there, where we had like you know, the partial t term on the left and everything else on the right. So we're just going to move everything to the right with some subtraction. So that's what I've described here is that I've moved everything to the right with some subtraction and then also divided by the root t that was on um, partial t. So once we set it up to take the same form, right now it takes the same form as the theorem. Once we know how it takes the same form of the theorem, then we're going to actually identify what is gamma of x. That's just the 
the function of time that multiplies x or gamma prime of x. What is gamma prime of y? That's the function of time that multiplies partial y. So we're just going to identify those two objects. We're going to find their antiderivatives. Let's go ahead and find some antiderivatives. You can, you can phrase this in terms of an initial value problem if you want to, but you certainly don't have to. You know, what are we actually doing here? Is we're just we're just finding an, an integral. This is just an integral. And choosing the constant. So gamma of x at 0 is actually x. OK, right there's my initial condition. I've taken an antiderivative of negative t to the 3 halves. Uh, the antiderivative of that is negative 2 fifths t to the 5 halves. But then I, it's really plus c. I choose c so that I, I make sure I achieve the initial condition that at 0 it's equal to x. So you can verify. Just plug 0 in for time, 0 in for time, boom, you get x. Um, and then you do the same thing for y. So we're going to find an antiderivative of t to the 1 half and t to the minus 1 half. We get 2 thirds t to the 3 halves plus 2 t to the 1 half. Let's just make sure that when we plug in 0, plug in 0, 0, 0, we choose our constant so that that's equal to y. So that's just the important thing is that gamma as a vector at time 0 needs to be x, y, because that's the starting point of my function. So you just find those antiderivatives, choose those constants to be x, y. And then what does the theorem say? There's my theorem. It says the solution is just given by the initial condition of the PDE evaluated at the curve gamma. So I'm going to go back to the PDE here. There's my initial condition. I'm now going to evaluate that at the gamma x I just found and the gamma y I just found. So I'm just going to plug gamma x in for x, gamma y in for y. I go down here. I plug gamma in for x, gamma y for y. It's just cosine of gamma x, sine of gamma y. And that's the solution to the PDE. So these are actually pretty, pretty straightforward. They're kind of the simplest PDEs to be able to solve. We can take these to one larger extent. And that's that. Suppose there's my, this is my original flow PDE. And it's a little trickier than that. Let's add some additive terms here multiplicative term against phi and maybe some external forcing. If we jump back, this is just Duhamel's principle applied to this homogeneous ODE. So, so we have a homogeneous ODE and then we use Duhamel's principle and then we see that now our, our solution is a little bit more complicated. But what's happened is that we've translated everything from before. We're still just evaluating there's gamma prime. We're evaluating its antiderivative in G. But then we pay some prices for what's left over. Here's a multiplicative term. Just like ODEs, we're going to get an exponential to the antiderivative of that multiplicative term. And then Duhamel's principle says, hey, I'm actually going to consider the forcing as you know another exponential and then an antiderivative of that. Um, so it's just a slightly more complicated solution formula that's going to broaden the amount of, of PDEs that you can actually solve with this with this process. Of course, in the case when m is 0, then this is e to the 0 power, which is also known as 1. e to the 0 power, also known as 1. When f is 0, f is 0. So this entire antiderivative is gone, and we recover exactly the solution that we just used. So really, this corollary is something you can focus on and use for all sorts of, of PDEs that take this form. The only problem is that right, the main problem of this form is that gamma can only depend on time. Right, so this is more or less to say that the velocity that's affecting my, my uh, solution is only a function of time. The velocity doesn't evolve over space. So that's kind of a tricky thing that you have to deal with and make sure is true here before you, you try to solve this way. Um, but let's go through an example of that as well. So we'll get an example here. I mean, these PDEs can start to look really ugly, so you just have to be careful that, that you're actually identifying all the pieces together, because like, here's a PDE that the previous corollary can technically solve for me, and we're going to go through the solution, but it looks really bad, and we just have to take our time identifying every piece. Okay, so once again, there's a multiplicative term against the partial derivative in time, and that's not what we want. If I jump up to the corollary, right, the corollary, I have solved for partial t phi on left hand side. So the entire left hand side only has partial t phi on it. Everything else is on the right hand side. So everything that's not partial t phi, even its coefficients, all have to go over to the right hand side. The only thing I want on the left hand side is partial t phi. So I'm going to do that. 
with this problem. And when I do that, I move everything over to the right-hand side and divide by the coefficient, I end up with this. Now we have to be clever about actually identifying every single piece that shows up in, in the corollary. And there's some pieces here. This is going to be gamma prime of x, or gamma x prime. This is going to be gamma y prime. This is going to be m of t. This is going to be f of t. So we're identifying, you know, in this case, because I'm in two spatial dimensions, four different terms, gamma x prime, gamma y prime, m and f, jump up to the corollary. This gamma prime is a vector of both x and y. I identify that as well as m and f. And once I do that, it's not too bad. I'm just going to directly translate everything into my solution formula and compute. So let's do that. So I've identified, here's gamma of x prime. There it is. Gamma of y prime. There it is. And then I'm going to find their antiderivatives, just like before. This is really just an extension of before. So let's go from gamma prime to gamma with some antiderivatives. And what we get out of that is uh, x plus e to the minus t minus t minus 1. That's the antiderivative of this with gamma x at 0 equals x, right? So if I put a 0 in there and a 0 in there, I need this to be equal to x. It definitely is. And then the same thing, antiderivative of y. The only difference is that my plus 1 became a minus 1. So my minus t is now a plus t. Okay, so there's gamma x, gamma y. Those are just going to go directly into g, right? This is g, the initial condition. Jump up back to the proposition or the corollary. g, my initial condition. Gamma is just going right into g. So I'm just looking, finding g. I'm plugging gamma into g, and that's going to be this. So if I end up putting those two in for x and y into g and simplifying, I get x plus y plus 2 e to the minus t. Then I have to finish off my solution where, recall, I identified m of t here. And inside my solution, it says I need to take an integral of that in the variable s. This is now the integral of ms. And that ends up in two places. It's technically m tau over here. I'm just going right into the, to the solution that I provided and putting all those terms in. And then I'm also identifying f, which is here, f of t by my solution, that ends up as f of s right here. And so at this point, I just have to perform a lot of antiderivatives. It's not the end of the world, right? These antiderivatives aren't the worst thing in the world. That's really just a logarithm. That's a logarithm. And then I'm going to use some exponential rules to simplify those logarithms. The one on the left simplifies to t plus 1 to the negative 4. This simplifies to s plus 1 to the 4 and t plus 1 to the negative 4. And that's just going to multiply. It's going to distribute across to both terms in f of s. And then I'm going to take the antiderivative of both of these independently. They're going to require a few integration by parts. Ideally, by now, you've gotten used to integration by parts again. And so this term becomes that term. Um, I've just directly translated those out front. Uh, but the integration by parts is going to give me this nice long uh, piece, which I wouldn't advise you to try to verify. I mean, we have computers that can perform these, these lengthy integration by parts. Uh, rather than, than doing it by hand. But at least you know the solution formula, you know how it works. Uh, this is a pretty nasty looking solution, but the fact that it fits on one page isn't bad. You know, we get to a point in mathematics where our solutions are a, a page or more long, which nobody wants to deal with. So this isn't that bad. The, you know, here's our, our original PDE that we were working with, and the PDE looks ugly, so it's not really a surprise that the solution looks ugly as well. The fact that we can fit it on one page and actually find it, I think it is, is quite nice. So then I'm going to jump into just the definition of what is a characteristic curve. So we've already been solving two PDEs, and I was saying that, that um, the name of the section is characteristic curves. We're not into the full method of characteristics yet, but what we've seen both versions of those PDE solutions were versions of the method of characteristics. And so we should talk about what does it actually mean to be a characteristic curve? Well, the definition of characteristic curve is simply any solution to a functional equation, so a functional solution, that can be written as a flow of a function. So a characteristic curve, well, really the flow, the curve, the flow considered as the input to the function which solves a functional equation is a characteristic curve. 
Okay, so we're just saying, hey, if my solution takes the form of a flow, and in fact it takes the form of a flow within another function, does it take the form of a curve embedded into another function? That curve is called the characteristic curve of the original equation. So if I jump up here, maybe in the second case, it doesn't look quite so much like a characteristic curve. And that's kind of true because we've kind of extended um, the notion of characteristic curve for the second setting. But certainly in the first case, the main theorem that I, that I introduced here, this is truly a characteristic curve right there. The solution is just the function of a curve. And as long as the solution is a function of a curve, the curve that's inside there is called the characteristic curve. So that's more just a, a definition because I'm going to be referring to characteristic curves the entire chapter. That's kind of the point of this chapter. And then we'll get into this nice proposition here, which is called characteristic curves of level sets. And we're not even going to use this proposition or cover examples because it's kind of outside the scope of, of PDEs to do this. Um, I guess technically in the next section, we kind of will be encountering these, but this is a very useful uh, proposition to make is that if you start with a function, this is a scalar field, right? Scalar fields, they map d-dimensional space to one-dimensional space, and then you take a path. And if you put a specific path inside of my scalar field, so if I put gamma inside of F and suppose that it equals the same value, suppose gamma inside of f equals the same value for all time, then, and this is really because it's an if and only if, then I know that as long as everything's differentiable, actually gamma solves a very specific system of ODEs. So this is a system of ODEs for which if I solve it, gamma lies within a level set, within a level set of F. Now keep in mind, what are level sets useful for? These are the, these are the definitions we use when we were talking about boundaries. All the way back in chapter one, when we said boundaries were incredibly useful objects, level sets and boundaries were the same thing, right? We were, we were working with that definition of the level set of level zero and that would represent a boundary. Well, what do I have here? I have a way of actually parameterizing the boundary. I have a way of finding curves within the boundary just by solving a system of ODEs. So I construct a system of ODEs. I'm taking a gradient of F, evaluating at gamma, dotting it against gamma prime, and setting that equal to zero. That's gonna be a system of ODE. I mean, it's technically not a system. It's really just an ODE in, in, in gamma. Um, yeah, I shouldn't call it a system, but it's an ODE in gamma. It's a, it's a scalar valued ODE. It's actually underdetermined in many situations um, because the, the boundary may be higher dimensional than one, but I have this, this collection of ODEs that I can solve. And if I solve it with the initial condition that I'm in some level set Y, then in fact, I remain in that level set for all times. This is just a useful thing to, to keep in mind that we can actually find paths through level sets. We can find paths through level sets via ODEs. That's just all we want to think about here, pass through level sets via ODEs. Um, and that will lead into the next, the next section. Uh, I do have a remark as to why this is useful. If you've taken differential geometry, you'll know that orthogonal or orthonormal coordinate charts are really useful, especially on the boundaries of manifolds or just manifolds in general. And this is really the proposition that allows you to find these things because you're going to, you're going to be asking questions about curves through manifolds and then asking for them to be orthonormal. So you'll want to find these curves, make sure they're, they're orthonormal. So the next section will be Hamiltonian systems. And that's where we're going to see this proposition take, take hold, but it's really a, a very strict version of this proposition. Um, and I'll get there in the next class. So I'll see you then. Bye.